Yeah, I think, you know, going back to that, we, I, I can, I know I can speak with, with you in mind because we started off on the forums yeah. and, you know, you're looking, you know, at someone's 30 minute exercise doing a speed painting or, you know, you're looking at something that was in terms of digital, because we're all looking at foundation, traditional art first yeah. and then building our foundation off of drawing and painting and knowing what line is and what form is and value and constructing our lighting and color on top of that. But I think the, the tools have changed so much now with digital that it's almost invisible. You can't, it's seamless and it integrates so well from yes. looking at someone's render to a painting. And it's so overlapped now that you can't tell what's what. Yeah. And I think that if you're a solid compositionalist and you understand the foundation and you understand good form and, and, and value, it, it takes away from <laughs> all the stories that we're trying to tell if you don't know those things. He is a production designer at Netflix and a former visual development artist who worked with DreamWorks on animation shows such as Kung Fu Panda, Megamind, and Turbo. Please welcome Jason Shire. In this episode, we covered such topics as art foundation and technology, how artists are adapting to new reality of working from home, and more. It was a blast to catch up with Jason and chat with him. Hope you're going to enjoy this as much as I did. Let's go. met you online <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah when we briefly dated online <laughs> <laughs> on tinder uh, oh yeah <laughs> on facebook Tinder, whatever uh, grinder uh, uh, <laughs> we uh you were still at at uh dreamworks yeah you were, you were i think you were working on uh what was uh kung fu panda back wow then? that was like 2008 yeah that's already I like 12 years ago Okay, yeah, I think the yeah. first time we spoke was 2010 or 11. I think so, yeah. So you, were past, right. you were past first Kung Fu Panda. Yeah, and I've known your work since Saijin, because I used to be on the okay. forum. Oh, for, there you, you go. Know, so I've been doing it for a while and mostly following, you know, Craig Mullins, as we all did, and, you know, uh, Lingy, you know, Lingy was posting yeah. on there and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's... And then the whole blogger days, I, I remember when everybody just had a blog and was like uploading images on their blogs. And yeah. I got 15 comments. Oh, my God. <laughs> so insane. Good times, man. 15 yeah. comments. You were like just you were a Scrooge McDuck with the... <laughs> <laughs> you could flex on comments. <laughs> That's ridiculous, dude. Yeah. Duck Tales right there. Easy. <laughs> Easy going back to the Duck Tales days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those are good times though like yeah it is. i don't know there was something about the the slower pace of learning and mm -hmm. and um you know like the progression of software and hardware w wasn't so intense so you True. had time to sort of like you know dive in and check it out and see if it works for you and develop some right. like you know habits and whatnot now it's like yeah the moment you dive in and check it out and and you know, oh, I know. Check if it works for you. There's an, already an update or like another yeah. software, you know. Or like, you know, someone's invented like 17 new hotkeys for Blender or something by the time you've logged into Blender, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy how yeah. fast it's moving now. Um, yeah. I mean, it's it's great for us, right? Because uh, the is. tools are just right now you can do so much stuff that you couldn't do before. And totally. it just makes yeah. just makes the production process much easier. Makes you so like, you know, let's say like ten years ago, if you had an idea for a short film, it would be impossible like certain things would be impossible for you to do unless you right. would like really dive in and learn and spend like a year or like half a year to really understand the software and whatnot. I remember V Ray used to be where you would have to like sit with calculator and and, and calculate, okay. 
what kind of samples are I gonna put into light, shadow, right. and then render? And then yeah. make like this weird equation that's like, oh, like if there's too many samples here, there should be less samples here. And if there's less samples here, there should mm -hmm. be more samples here. It's like, what am I? Oh, I remember that. What am I, yeah. like a calculator here? Like, what's going on? It's just like Final Gather, you had to keep inputting like how many hundreds of, you know, DPI dots you have to put in in your Final Gather right, after yeah. you post-processed. And then mm -hmm. on top of your render, you have to wait for the Final Gather to collect. And you're like, ah, uh, and now everything is on RTXs and in real time. And you're like, whoa, this is a whole new game. Exactly. You know? Yeah, it's That's crazy. True. It's crazy. Like now you press a it button crazy. and it renders. It's True. So good. Yeah, Octane and Blender, all those uh, great tools now that are almost free. You know yeah. that yeah. It, it's Maya. It used to be like a ten thousand dollar package that nobody can get their hands on unless they were in a studio, and unless you had a crack. But you know, yeah. that's <laughs> unless you had unless you had a uh, rub elbows with with, yeah. with torrent sites. <laughs> You do that on your Mac because it's like hack proof to the viruses. You, yeah. you keep it away from your PC. <laughs> oh, man. And then like you look, OK, you install it. It's like, OK, I don't know how to use it because there's no YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Or you have like Napster running in the background, downloading your music while you're getting your software. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crazy no times, man. Yeah. Crazy no, it times. sounds like we're, from, we're cut from the same cloth and yeah. or from the same era of I mean, we could, when we, we could came go. up. We could go back further and, and talk about rotary phones. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I was around. 80s, dude. We saw that hap happening. People didn't switch over to dial-up for a while. Calling your friends and they're like... And then the, their their mom is picking up the phone. It's like, oh, he left. And he's yeah. not going to be here for like an hour or two. It's like, oh, <laughs> crap. And then like you, you make a meeting with someone... Yeah. Hey, like, be there at two. It's like two thirty. I think they died. Yep. I have no <laughs> idea where they are. And then the pager days when you're like sending digital text to like translate into like written word. You're like, right. hi, hell. It's using threes and uh, and sevens as L's and and E's. Yeah, I, I remember those days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Time's moving on. It's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, but it, it seems is. like it's. I mean, it seems like uh, amidst everything that's going on this year, it's 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 a kind of a on the professional level, it's a good year already. It is right. No, it is. Yeah, I think specifically speaking to the professional side, I think for me, it's helped me kind of become more myopic and mm -hmm. like kind of slow down and really look at what I'm doing in my process. And I think that's something that I didn't do before where I was like, just kind of like trying to scrounge for any materials I could to get stuff done on a deadline. Whereas right. now it's like, Hey, I have all these books at home. I haven't looked at them in a while and I've been collecting books for years and I have this huge library. So I've been pulling them out and scanning pages and really diving deep into the research again. And I think that's something I wasn't doing enough of before. And right. now I'm growing again as an artist. So that like, even though this is a terrible time, it's been a beautiful time too, because it's like awakened my mind again. So yeah. that's really special. That's great. That's great. Slowing down, uh, helps. Yeah. I was actually hoping for it, you know, like when all the world COVID thing hit and like, it was mm -hmm. just such a giant uncertainty of what's going to happen. Um, I was like, Oh man, like, I know it sounds fucked up, but I was like, I've been working like, non-stop for maybe a year and a half now right yeah and so i was hoping like maybe it's like a good chance to take a break no yep. no nope, work coming in <laughs> yeah and you know like at the time like, like that when the work's coming in you take it because like, you don't know what's gonna oh, happen absolutely. yeah you just take it so yeah feast or famine right yeah. and you gotta have that mentality of like a freelancer where you're like if i don't accept this job now there might yeah. not be an overlap here and you just got to keep overlapping that bridge and moving on to the next assignment. Even yeah. for myself, having like a stable studio job, I took a lot of freelance work because I was like, hey, I might lose my job. And back when I was at DreamWorks, I was let go. Yeah. So, you know, there was that I always had that seed of uncertainty inside my soul that I was like, God, I got to keep this moving. I got to keep learning. I got to give back. And so that stuff has always been embedded in me, you know, 
right. no matter where I go or where I push position myself in my career. Let's jump into that maybe, you know, yeah. at DreamWorks, you were uh, pretty much doing visual development, right? For the most, yeah. for the most part. Uh, yeah, for DreamWorks, I started off in 2008 and my first project was Kung Fu Panda. And it was a, first there was the James Baxter intro that they did was all 2D. They were all mm -hmm. flat background paintings that were composited in After Effects. And that team, the James Baxter team, hired me to do Secrets of the Furious Five, which was this like beautiful uh, interstitial short that had all the Furious Five characters, mm -hmm. everybody from Viper to, you know, you had uh, Pan you know, the monkey and then the panda story and all their backstories, all 2D. So I got a chance to work with these like amazing layout artists, Mick DeFalco, Lorendo Martinez that came from Disney that worked on Hunchback and stuff like that. They were doing these big workbook pages mm -hmm. in hand-drawn line drawing they would give that to me and i'd paint digital backgrounds with that and we were doing like two a day maybe three a day of these Damn. background paintings and we crushed it in like three months we got through the entire short uh and i was working weekends like golden hour and stuff like that but that was such an awesome experience because i was right there with some of the best guys working at dreamers for years and years like ramon zebok and uh these guys tang hang you know these dudes are legends already and right. you're walking down these hallways and there's these there's room size paintings that were like printed up on the wall and it wasn't it was osmosis if you're around this stuff you're going to absorb the amount of detail and the artistic yeah. intelligence that these each artist brought into their backgrounds and viz dev was a transition for me because i came from layout into viz dev and then viz dev was more you know right out of the imagination, creative thought, and just pure on the tip of your tongue thinking. Right. And that was, that's so cool because you get to get a script and just look at written word and then translate the written word into visuals. Yeah. Just like, you know, just like what we were doing in game concept art early, earlier on, it's like, you know, you work with a game designer, they're just spitballing, brainstorming with you about mm -hmm. what the process of the level is going to be. And you're building in the narrative with visuals, you know, yeah. as you did at Naughty Dog. So it's very similar, but it's, I feel like there's two different sides to it in a, in an animation world. It's, it's generally a moving or a fixed camera, which is a character itself. Yeah. And, but in games, it's open world. You know, you're, you're a player looking at every asset inside of, you know, looking at every part of the object and yeah. have to design every part of it. So I feel like games was where I cut my teeth because it's so hard to ortho, ortho out at the world. You're designing everything. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah. You don't have like fixed camera angle, and no, you're not keyframing anything. You, I mean, you can, but you have to design everything because player is just gonna wander off, and they just like, hey, what exactly? Is that? What is this? What is that? You know? Yeah, like side quest. Okay, I'll go learn about this. Yeah. How long no you've been? Doubt. How long you've been working in the industry? Like, what it, what was like the first real, you know, professional yeah. job you 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 go you got. I've been an illustrator since 1998. Okay. I, I, oh, I graduated nice. from, from high school in 98 and I did album covers and Got you know, illustration for you know publication and editorial work. But I didn't move into the concept art world until 2003. And that's when I first started college, actually. And I met an instructor by the name of Carlo Arleano, mm -hmm. who is uh, an amazing character and object designer. That worked on like Planet of the Apes and stuff like that. And he was like the guy that was like, hey, this is what you should be doing, not the editorial publication stuff. This is really cool stuff. And I and I really focused in on designing objects for film. Mm -hmm. And animation was always um, my biggest inspiration. I always liked all the Disney movies and like right. the Jungle Book and Sword in the Stone and that stuff like danced in my mind all the time. I'm like, how do I get into that but do something that's a little bit more provocative and groundbreaking. And just until this last, I'd say two years ago, when mm -hmm. they started to work on like Love, Death and Robots, that's when I think both of the worlds that I'm really you know, excited about are merging in the center. Spider-Verse kind of started to do that where you were telling real human stories. All the boutique studios were doing it in France and Germany and, and Russia for a right. long time. But it took a long time. J Japan's been doing it for years with anime. But it's taken a long time for the U.S. market, the domestic market, to, to catch on to how an adult story can be told in animation. Yeah. With yeah. death, sex, everything, drugs, 
And that's where I got excited because I'm like, these worlds are finally starting to clash right in the middle. And there's an ex there's a spark happening now. It's a real rebirth and a renaissance. It's really cool. Yeah, Netflix yeah. opened up a lot of doors because of that, you know? Um, totally, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's a... Uh, I. You can argue whether Netflix has like the library of, of, of films and animations, whether that's, you know, quality or not, because a yeah. lot of them aren't. Um, that's true. But, but you cannot argue with the fact that they're taking chances, you know? Absolutely. And I think, you know, it's about content now. It's a content war. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's the nature of that kind of a business where you're, you're grabbing content from everywhere. Um, and I think that's okay. But then, like you said, some of the quality starts to kind of drop in some areas. Um, I am super excited about what's happening right now because I'm kind of on the inside of that. And I'm seeing what they're doing and they're trying to restructure it. And you can right. see the quality is coming back and they're going for potency and strong you know, nice. storytelling and, and, the, and they're giving power to creators. So the animation side versus the live action side are completely different worlds. So that's one thing I could speak about is that animation is groundbreaking and they are bringing the top people in they're sucking it's like a black hole of talent right and they're bringing all these great people together into one place and so you're going to get amazing content in the next three years that's going to just blow people's minds it's amazing well i'm dropping my film soon so i'm gonna be yeah. first <laughs> <laughs> no doubt man yeah they're gonna pull you right in better yeah, watch who out knows? who knows better watch out better yep. watch out no. Yeah. How about you, man? What have you been up to in, you know, the last uh, few years? I haven't heard much about what you've been up to. So, I mean, it depends how far we want to go. <laughs> well, I know that you were with Naughty Dog yeah. for a while and then you've been doing a lot of film work. Uh, yeah. And what are you doing most currently? Is it something you could talk about or is it kind of still a little bit more hush hush NDA? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, the first thing, I cannot believe it's been like, I think almost seven years now since I left Naughty Dog. Is it really seven yeah. years? 2013. Wow. Yeah, 2013 is when I left, I think. So that's right around the time that I left DreamWorks because DreamWorks was 14 for me. So, yeah, it was, it was yeah, either six, 13 or 14. Years. I cannot remember anymore. Wow, that's crazy. One of those. So it's like six, seven years. It's, it's insane because it feels like yesterday. And I still, you know, I yeah. still have a bunch of friends that, that work there. And we talk all the time. Um, That's awesome. But yeah, yeah. since then it was it's it's been mostly film for for a bunch of years, and then Magic Leap, which I don't know what's going on there <laughs> anymore. Yeah, <laughs> it kind of yeah. it kind of came. It was going awesome, and then it went away like abruptly. I think the COVID nineteen oh, no. had like some serious, you know, effects effects on this. Um, sure. But it's been mostly, you know, mostly film. There's been, mm -hmm. there's, there, there, there've been projects that were pretty cool, like the the campaign we we did for Phantom Nike. Oh wow! With the uh, with the avatars, that was pretty yeah. cool. Um, you know, the Blade Runner posters with Alkin. So cool. Yeah. Yeah. Did you meet Did you meet um, uh, Ridley Scott? No, I didn't. Um, when I was at Alcon working on Darkmouth, I worked with Andrew and Broderick, who are the founders of, of the Alcon Entertainment Group, mm -hmm. and, and Kira Davis as well. And they're, God, that was such a group, great group because coming from, sorry to sideline a little bit, um, coming from uh, animation where there's like all that bureaucratic tape going through all the political right. you know, infrastructure, they were not that way. They came from an independent side. So yeah. they, again, it's like about the creators and it's about the art. And so they were open to it. They had this Blade Runner thing that they started to develop. And, you know, as Blade Runner 2049 came out, they used him to consult. And it's just amazing how in touch they were with all the creators. And I know yeah. Ridley was really close with that group. So that's cool. Did you get a chance to speak with him and yeah. work with him? Oh, you yeah, did? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. <clears throat> that's amazing. The posters I did with Ash, you know, like it all started with with basically, you know, having a meeting with, with yeah. Ridley. I met with him. come true. Oh, man. I was like, what the hell is going on? You know, yeah. what is this life? Um, no, it was amazing. <laughs> we actually, it, it was crazy because when I met him, we spent first 
this fir- first half an hour, maybe 45 minutes, maybe even an hour. I can't remember. But a yeah. long time just talking. Talking about like wow. he was talking about his film work. It almost it almost felt like podcasts that I couldn't record. Yeah. It's just, oh my God. It was like, oh, I wish I had it recorded. Because it was yeah. just like amazing, you know? He would, he would awesome. tell stories about, you know, some of his films, his brother, like all of those things. It was just amazing. And he's just such a sweet, sweet person too, you know? Yeah. Like the sweetest guy you're going to meet. Um, no, but but we had a blast. I was hired to do the work and uh, to come up with those posters <clears throat> in that, you know, Mobius-esque. I love vibe. that style. It's and so beautiful. I, you know, I was like, I can do it myself, but I want to work with friends. So we, of course. we got we got Ashen as well and we crushed it. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm still so proud. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, those posters are great. Those are yeah, like, they, they're memorable and they resonate. And the cool thing about them is you guys had your take on them. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't something conventional that people had seen before. Like you said, it was Mobius esque. But you could see Ash and yourself put your own twist on it, your own fingerprint. Yeah. And, you know, I could see a bit of what you're doing with your own style, but Ash is doing it in his own style. And it's infused and it overlaps beautifully in that world, in the Blade Runner world. And I think yeah. that's what's so cool about Blade Runner, too, is now there's all of these new stories that are being told in the Blade Runner world. And that's so, that's super special. That's amazing. Yeah, it's becoming a franchise. It is. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. That's super nice. But yeah, other than that, I mean, this year has been, you know, the film projects that I was on mm-hmm. uh, with Marvel. And um, what else? I mean, I've been focusing mostly on making my, my short uh, finished, you know. I'm so close. Just a couple of, couple of mud paintings and, and color grading and that's it. Oh, my God. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. That's maybe be maybe by the Maybe by the time this podcast comes out, it should be either already done or, you know, getting close to release i feel yeah yeah that's great no i can't wait to see it that's amazing i that's so special too that going back to what we were talking about about becoming more focused on ourselves after this situation has started it's helping us kind of retune our thinking about personal work too and being becoming more independent entrepreneurs and i'm doing the same i have my own personal project that i've been working on since man since college and now i'm kind of diving back into the storytelling aspect of it and and really focusing in on what is what is my voice and how do I bring something to the world that people haven't seen? And that's something that those are questions you don't get to ask yourself when you're constantly working on someone else's project. Right. And it's a special time for that. And I know it's harder for people that are home that have families, have kids, because you're turning your attention to that plus your work. And so it becomes compounding and layering. Um, fortunately I don't have any kids just yet, so I can kind of become more like focused in on myself and as selfish as it sounds, it's kind of important to, as an artist, because you, you're constantly giving away your knowledge and giving away your skill sets to better another company versus yourself. So it's special time now to have that opportunity to do that. You know, most of the artists I know are selfish. They are. Yep. They They are. are. I mean, to to a degree. Um, to a degree of selfishness of time, let's put it this way. Oh you, yeah, yeah, totally. Spending time on developing yourself is, man, it's the most important thing I would say. Yeah, it's the most important thing. Just judging how things are developing from software and hardware perspective, you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, look at I'm looking at it from a perspective of, you know, everyone is everyone was. So like a month ago, I think it was a month ago, maybe a few weeks ago, this new Unreal 5 trailer came out, right? And everyone's yeah. blown away, right? Rightfully so. It's amazing. Like, yep. I, I think that's the way it looks. Like, it just it's just getting so close to, to uh, ray traced rendering. Mm-hmm. And I think that it, it does ray, ray tracing, right? Uh, it does. The calculation, yep. like you... Be, I think real-time much... global illumination... Real time occlusion, you can have like millions and millions of polygons on screen right, now, tri- right. triangulated gons and trigons, <clears throat> what do they call them? Um, that's unbelievable that you can do that now. And it's the crazy thing about Unreal, too. I just started to learn it this year. 
and I've always, it was one of those things that was on my bucket list yeah. that I just couldn't, did get, didn't get a chance to do. It was always like on my computer installed, but not open. And I was like, what am I doing? Just open the editor, man. Like start moving around objects. And cause That's I knew really Maya, what it takes just yeah. open and start playing. Yeah. And don't even look at the tutorials. Just do it the way you feel comfortable because I find that tutorials can slow you down sometimes. Yeah. It's almost like just letting yourself feel the universe around you and grabbing you know, the tools and seeing how those tools interface with yourself. And that's where you start to become a creator. It's like kind of like a kid with a block and you have a triangular shape, a circle shape and a square. And you're just trying to fit those pieces in until you get it. Yeah. And it's the same thing with the program. You just got to take the time to just sit there and understand it in the way you feel comfortable understanding it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a wet dream for artists. It really is. It, is. it really is. I mean, I've tried, I've tried the current version. It's great. Yeah. Um, 424. Yeah. Yeah. But you, I mean, you still have to optimize the, you do. Yeah. You still have to optimize. You cannot just draw in high res. No. Um, and it's, and it's buggy too. Cause I've been, I bring stuff in from Maya that I built yeah. and then I just, you know, bring it in and it's like, Oh, I got to import this a certain way. And then it comes in all weird parts. And then you're like, oh, I got to combine this to bring it in. Nah, into man, sections. You, just, you just switch to OG software. You just use 3ds Max and, and that just bridges directly into, yeah, that's into right. Unreal. You'd think they'd get that by now, though, since Autodesk has bought, you know, Autodesk has bought 3D Studio Max. It's Maya and Studio Max and Mudbox. It's like all a single package. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. I should get back into the OG. That's where I learned was in 3D Studio Max. Oh, you did? I did. Oh, okay. That was my first program. Yeah, I still I still use it. It's what's my it's my to oh, go really? to. Yeah. Oh, cool. I, maybe I should just pick it back up again. Um, are you playing with Blender at all? Yeah, I mean I use it oh, for you're... work too. Yeah, it's oh, great. Cool. It's it's amazing. Yeah. Um, there's, it's amazing for what it is. It's amazing for what it offers, and um, it has its own limitations. Sure. You cannot. Of course. You cannot comfortably work with scenes that have, let's say, 10 million polygons and 2,000 objects. That's become sure. It's very difficult to work with a scene like that in right. Blender. Maybe so. You have to definitely optimize quite a bit before you attack a, a project. Yeah, like how I, I mean, like it's de there is definitely a performance issue when it comes to like large scenes for sure. Yeah, that um, makes sense. But but also considering that the software, I mean, at the current version, two point eight, right? It's only, yeah. only only has been like a year, maybe a year and a half. It's pretty impressive on like how stable oh, yeah. and how well it's done for PC. I think yeah. um, to me, it's like if I had a chance, if if I if I could just use like a magic wand, right, mm -hmm. and say, okay, let me pick some software that's gonna work on on Mac, right? Yeah. Uh, with with GPU render, this is gonna be this, this, and this, and then I'm just throwing my PC away. That's, <laughs> I'm really at this stage where I get you. I it's almost you like it's almost like the Stockholm syndrome with with yeah. the PC right now. Like I'm being it abused, is. but but I but I'm I, I still love it. <laughs> I'm, I'm the exact same way. I'm a P PC guy for life, man. Uh, my dad always had PCs in the house. Never had a Mac. We had I mean we had an Apple IIe. You know, mm -hmm. and a Commodore and all that old stuff. But for me, the PC was like where you can do everything finally. And re it was really customizable, yeah. too. And but you had to do all the updates and make sure all the drivers were working because things would get all super buggy on you. Like for me recently, I've had to like update everything because my webcam, like I was saying, it was having issues with my webcam because the driver wasn't working and it crashed my computer into a blue screen. So here I am on my iPad having a conversation with you because it's, it's Stockholm syndrome, man. Dude. Yeah. yeah. I'm telling you, like if, if 3ds Max and V-Ray were on working as well as they do on Mac, I would not yeah. have a PC anymore. No, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mac OS is so much better, so much more stable, it is. so much easier, better privacy. Like there's just... harder to hack into. Yeah. 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 Privacy is, is a huge thing, especially now. Oh you yeah. Know. Oh yeah. Especially now. No doubt, man. Oh, yeah. 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 So are, how's everything going with teaching? Are you still teaching classes? I haven't done a class in a while. Okay. Oh, it's been a while. It's, it's 
happened like here is actually yeah. it was like where's your next class you know yeah. um it comes down to priorities i think um of course. but i do have a plan for next class i mean i've been planning for here's the thing i don't like personally teaching things that i've already taught you know i don't like like hey i, I, I just you. i just like made an illustration and and showed you how i work f- with photoshop now i'm gonna make exactly same thing just different character and different setting and sell it it's like i get it i get mm-hmm. it like this is this is where this is where more of like a thinking process and and workflow comes in right okay like you know maybe the tools are the same maybe the execution is similar but you know the the change you are expecting now is looking at okay the different subject matter means i'm going to use the, the the tools in a slightly slightly different way right Right. It's almost like I feel like this kind of this kind of stuff is like hand holding people, which it's true. Yeah. Which we all know that these days, people, the the kids that are learning art, not all of them, but most of them, unfortunately, they just cannot go past hand holding like they have to be. Hand you know, yeah, I think, you know, going back to that, we I, I can I know I can speak with with you in mind because we started off on the forums. Yeah. And, you know, you're looking, you know, at someone's 30 minute exercise doing a speed painting or, you know, you're looking at something that was in terms of digital because we're all looking at foundation traditional art first. Yeah. And then building our foundation off of drawing and painting and knowing what line is and what form is and value and constructing our lighting and color on top of that. But I think the, the tools have changed so much now with digital that it's almost invisible. You can't it's seamless and it integrates so well from. Yes. looking at someone's render to a painting and it's so overlapped now that you can't tell what's what. Yeah. And I think that if you're a solid compositionalist and you understand the foundation and you understand good form and, and, and value, it, it takes away from <laughs> all the stories that we're trying to tell. If you don't know those things, because yeah. you know, like the tools can only go so far and you know, I know it's a, it's a story that's been told on your podcast as well. I've heard other you know, speakers talk to this, that it could just be a great rendering and everybody knows you can render well, but it comes down to how well, you know, that foundation and that's what all the bones are to an image. So I think no matter what, as a teacher, that's why I wanted to bring this up was we just got to keep reminding, go back to foundation and have good strong foundation skills. Cause I see a lot of really great art, but it's not foundationally solid, you know? No. Yeah. It's much easier to get the lighting right, like yeah, in terms of mm-hmm. rea- realism or just sure. okay, so it doesn't look like completely odd. It's much easier not to make perspective mistakes because you know obviously three right. uh, D. It's much easier to nail colors like base mm-hmm. baseline colors. Because, That's true. You know, you just plug in your bridge with the quick quick scan, like the Quixel yeah, mega scans and. You have colors right there, and that that's coming from it's the true. from the render engine. But well, once yeah, you want to get I, on that level of keyframe of like, you know, more sophisticated, color graded, you know, mm-hmm. with artistic stylized choices, that, that you just you, right. you have to yeah, you have to know foundation. I feel like also because of all the tools, it's made me shy away from three D and personal work. Mm-hmm. So the stuff I do for my personal in my personal time, I don't I barely use any 3D at all. And it's all just Photoshop painting and getting back into, you know, just digital tools and painting with brushes and getting that that texture back, that hand drawn, that feeling of an artist's hand being intact back versus a tool. Age. Yeah, it's the Bronze Age of when we first started. And <laughs> and uh, it's like you guys always talk about juice, right? You, you see the juice in there that an artist brings to the table and I miss that expressionism. So right. I do that for personal stuff, but for work, I have to do the 3d stuff because I'm building a world it's world building. So yeah. I have to have physical space. I have to respect the scale of a person inside of an, of an environment. And you can only do that so far in a painting. They're like, Oh, the, the person that you're working with is like, turn that around. Oh wait, I got to redraw that now. Yeah. But if you build it, it's there, you can turn it around, then paint on top of it, which makes it that much easier, you know? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a blessing and the curse when it comes to that because like a blessing is that you get to 
sort of enjoy and explore the unpredictive nature of the drawing. Right. With render, it's like if you rotate your character, you know exactly how it's going to look. It's going to look exactly the same, just from different angle. Yeah. But you have all the full control over how it's going to be lit, how it's going to be, like all of those things, right? And to, right. to a degree, you have that with painting as well. Yes. But with painting, it's like there's an unpredictability because like your drawing skills, you know, they might be perfect, but still like there's going to be those imperfections Right. And the change of I like mind. that though. Yeah. That's cool. I think that's I think that's part of us growing and being constantly students too. And you know, I'm by no means a perfection in what I do. I'm not a master. I never considered myself a master. But I feel like just by showing your mistakes, someone can help you improve. And yeah. that's okay. I think that's like just be strip be a stripped down version of yourself when you create personal work. And then, then you put it out there and, hey, you know, maybe your lighting could be a little bit better. Or maybe you could could have stylized that shape a little more. And I'm cool with that. And critique is important because you're never going to grow unless you can accept a critique. So that's great, man. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. But coming back to teaching, like I've, I focused more on um, on making sure that we have great teachers rather than yeah. teaching myself. You know? Sure. Yeah, that's no, sort no, of no. like the the route that I personally took with with the company, and you know, yeah. Andrew is my my business partner. He's the co-founder, and he's doing more of like the behind the door. You know, sure. Everything you see, there's like a there's like a logic behind it. Totally, uh, like the structural logic. So he, you know, he's that's more, amazing. More in veins of of doing that. So that's so I I really honor you for doing Learn Squared because. Not, I don't think people realize how hard it is to do it to make a school, number one, and then also to get the talent that you do, uh, you know, and recruit people that are going to be, you know, bedrocks for making mm -hmm. a great, a great uh, product that people can focus on and grow upon. Because I think in the very beginning, when I first started my career, Concept Design Academy was the first, you know, real brick and mortar Kevin school. Chen. Yeah, Kevin Chen school. And I, I have a huge nod to him for what he brought to the table because here, besides Nomon DVDs, <clears throat> there was finally a place yeah. that you can go to that was an actual school school that was about concept art. And yeah. then that was like, wait a second, this is amazing. And you had Kang Lee coming there to do workshops. And I was always just like so enamored by the work that they were bringing to the table. I was like, this is amazing. There's so much world building and storytelling and character mm -hmm. creation that I didn't get from a Nomon DVD. And then you can finally ask questions real time to someone. Right. And then now this is all online and, you know, learn squared and CGMA was one of the very first to do it. And I was teaching classes yeah. on there and that was wonderful, man. I'm, I'm so happy that now you don't have to just turn on a DVD. You can get online and interface with the teacher and get real-time feedback or have uh, a module sent to you that you can review. So yeah, this is, uh, this is a great time to be an artist, and it's a great time to be in our industry as entertainment designers because there's so much content out there. It's right. a um, – my cat's going crazy. Ah, One second. That's all good. There he is. There he is. <laughs> ah, <laughs> what a cutie. <laughs> oh, man. Um, you, you, you went to, um, you went to art center, right? For a short time. I, I went to Cal State Fullerton first for fine arts illustration. And then after that, I went to the art Institute that are like all going out of business now. Good. <laughs> it was, it's, it, it's good, but I actually kind of feel bad because whilst I was there, I had great teachers. So there was no doubt that, you know, and even Charles Hugh was teaching there. And he was teaching a life drawing class and it was like, whoa, this is a good school, but it kind of like lost its steam after Argosy purchased them. And then you just saw this like disbanding of all those great teachers. So I'm glad they went out of business because they were screwing people with the financial aid yeah. and doing was, really shady shit behind the scenes. So that was a giant, good. I think it was like a giant lawsuit. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I didn't get what I wanted. I wanted to be an entertainment designer. Mm -hmm. So I, I asked Scott Robertson if I can join up in the entertainment track. And that's where I was taking night classes while I was at uh, AI. And I was looking at what all these guys were doing at the time. Like there was so many great artists coming out of like John Park was coming out at that time. 
Um, you know, James Pack was just finishing Kang. Jamie Jones was just like hanging out on the campus. Like I had people I can just, they were at my disposal. They were friends yeah. that I was hanging out with. And it was finally a community that I wasn't getting at the other schools. And so I was like, of course, I'm going to go to Art Center. And then Concept Design Academy opened up. And I'm like, this is even more amazing because it's like concentrated. It was like yeah. this like huge bubble of just insight that was missing. And I don't know if you ever went to all those um, workshops that Noman was doing. Like Fang was out there doing stuff and Craig Mullins came out and did workshops. It was awesome. And I was just, I was that nerd in the crowd taking notes and I was, I'm still that person. If there's a good workshop, I'll be there. I'll go be a fly on the wall in the back, but I'm going to learn just like everybody else is. Cause there's always something to learn. Yeah, you know? of course. Of course. What do you think this is all going to go? I mean, I think, I think this is a time where people realize not only, yeah. in, not only in the workforce, because like, I mean, I've, I've, I've been talking about this for too much, but. You know, you That's have okay. companies. You have companies that realize now that, hey, like we have, we have all of our workers working online, and they do uh, as productive or even more productive work than ever before. Why we are having those giant offices? I think in, this in is the, the cities, new right? normal. Yeah, the sorry to cut you off. I no go the, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. Um, this is our new normal, especially with the working from home situation, mm -hmm. I'm already set up to work from home. I was when I was even at the studio. Yeah, same. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't, I just sat down and I was, I was working from home. And the cool thing for me about that, which is also bad at the same time, there's a, there's a, there's a good and bad equal to it. It's a yin and yang that is right, like always pushing on each other. And I think the problem with it is the overhead's going to go away. They're going to realize they don't need to have a brick and mortar location for people to go into. And that whole entire world is going to go away. It's going to be remote completely. And yeah. it's sad because there is something beautiful about community and having a culture yeah. in a studio. I miss that a lot, actually. I miss having my art director come into my office and the, just the two of us are just having a great conversation about life together. And when you're doing yeah. it over a, a phone call or you know a digital phone call, there's distractions and you've seen me, I've been distracted by my phone. I have a delivery coming in today. There's like life is happening around me, but whereas yeah. in you're in the studio, it's just your work. And then you have your phone in your office somewhere and you're disconnecting a little bit. And I miss that part of it. And so the tangibility, the physicality of it, I think it's changed forever. It will change forever. Until someone comes and like, Hey man, what are you working <laughs> on? <laughs> and they're like, fuck. Yeah. I just got interrupted. Yeah, exactly. Um, but what what is your take on 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 schools specifically? Because like I think a mm. lot of students now realize as well that hey, I'm paying like twenty k yeah. a year for yeah. this for this school, and I'm not even getting anything out of it. You know, and, I, and it seems like mm. well, Zoom kind of works too for most for yeah. the most part. It does. You know, it does. I I feel the same way you do. Um, don't quote me on this, but quote me on this, that I think that the world yeah. of brick and mortar is going away yeah, for no schools. Expert, and it has, it has been. It has been. It makes me sad, though, because Brainstorm, for example, I've been teaching at Brainstorm. When I have free time, I'll do a class here and there. But there's nothing like people that really want to be there that are in a room with you. And when you're instructing, there's an energy right. and, a and a physical space that you don't get from online. And it's like sitting with someone side by side and doing a draw over for them or giving them feedback right there. It's second to none, man. It's so for important sure to have that yeah. opportunity. And, I'll, and I, I'm going to miss that. If that ever goes away, I'm really going to miss it. And I think that what I'm going to do is try to set up mentorships where I'm just one-on-one -on -one with people and still have that opportunity to do that. Right. Because I feel that we're going to be neglecting the most important <clears throat> part is – the interface with human beings and having that lifeblood right in front of you. Yeah. That, hey man, where you work now? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's a uh, extrovert nightmare and introverts dream. Yeah. It's really and I'm what both. It is. I'm I'm a weird introvert as well. Right. Uh, like when I'm talking to artists, it's not so hard. But when I'm talking with regular people, I should say, like the civilians. Um, civilians <laughs> it's harder to have people understand how we do things 
And, yeah. you know, I'm movies are ruined for me forever. Video games are ruined for me forever because I know how they're made. Yeah, you, you go know? you go to watch it in theaters. I was like, ah, yeah, I see what you did there. Like, yeah, it, exactly. It, 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 the the magic is lost. You look yeah, at it. A little that a little bit of that is gone. But every now and then, someone does something different. Yeah. And yeah. it surprises you. The illusion is back, and you're yeah. like, ooh, what the hell? How'd you do that? That's cool. I had that you with know? Sicario, like that border mm. scene. What? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, not at the moment, right? Like you watch it, it's a border scene, fine, right? Yeah. And then you you watch the behind the scenes and, and you get a little bit of information how things were done. Yeah. It's like, oh, it was all CG. You're like, are you oh, kidding no. me right now? What, yeah. What's going on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Even the Mandalorian, dude, yeah. with the whole volume thing, they're doing at ILM. Yeah. What the hell? Like they're finally using a game engine to make a show. Yeah. Yeah. That is, and we were just talking about Unreal, and I'm like, okay, if it's in camera, I believe it. It has real depth of field, and it and the light, the LED lights now that they're using yeah. to onset, you know, illuminate characters. Now they can finally have something to look at. It's not just a green screen or a blue screen. They did it's, that with that Oblivion so to a certain degree, but it was like much more complex rig that they've created. You know that yeah. whole scene, the this, this sky apartment, whatever. Right. Uh, they built like this giant dome, like it wasn't dome, it was like a cylinder around it that was, yeah. ba- I think was either LED projected or back projected so right. that they could get like realistic lighting, mm-hmm. uh, like ambient lighting instead of like the green screen, uh, right. and, which worked out great. But it was like vastly more complex and it still was a mixture of green screen as well, but like vastly more complex uh, setup. Right. Whereas with this, it's just like, yeah, it's it's kind of crazy how... And it it's is. also real time where, hey, like we can actually, you know, change the uh, the environment as we're working on it, you know, which it's, is crazy. It's my, and they had um, like real objects on set yeah, that are like right there that they can touch and reach out to props exactly. that they can pick up. And that's just the seamlessness of that and like the crossing over of both worlds. That's the next generation of what's going to happen. Yeah. And I'm not sure how they're handling that all right now with COVID because you still have to be in a place without PPE, you know, so that's going to be interesting too with the live action world for the next year and a half, two years from now. I think if there was no litigation against COVID, meaning like people were not so so triggered uh, in this country as they are, studios would not give a fuck and everything would be open. I agree. Everything everything is still sort of like in limbo and shut down and there's actually productions that are coming back on on their feet. Mm -hmm. And they are going to practice social distancing and all that stuff. But I feel like it's all, it's all just to not get sued. All of it is just like legal, nothing, nothing else. They, yeah, yeah. I think that's what it comes down to. It's the legality side and, and how much people feel comfortable as well. I think, you know, on my take on it, just a little bit, not just to get into the COVID thing, not too much, but I feel like we need to be really careful right now because I feel it's so unknown and And having family that works in, in healthcare, my, my brother's a nurse anesthetist. My mom's an OB, my dad's a doctor, family practice doctor. And that scares me because I see they're exposed to it every day and they don't have the the tools and the personal protective equipment that they need. The government's not giving him that stuff. So, you know, that concerns me because if it's that bad for them and they're on the front line, how's it going to be for us? So well, that's why I'm thinking about the big picture of it all. I read an article that the frontline workers have less infections than people that sit at home. And uh, and there was an interesting sort of follow-up, uh, which I initially learned from watching Joe Rogan's podcast with Dr. Rhonda Patrick. Yeah. Um, when they were talking about the vitamin D deficiencies and whatnot, apparently like 80% of people who ended up in ICU, ICUs were vitamin D is deficient and no one's looking at it, yeah. you know? Right. And I then, watched that podcast. That was great. Yeah, by the way. it was pretty great. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my mom, my mom is a health healthcare worker as well. She's more on, the, um, that's right. You were telling me. Yeah. She's on, uh, she's, a you know, x-ray, x-ray technician mm-hmm. by, by yep. trade. Uh, 
but you know she interfaces with doctors and mm-hmm. her, her friends are doctors and she, she's been in that for like past i worked in x-ray for seven years oh damn, the there you go yeah yeah so, but so so you know you interface with doctors and mm-hmm. nurses all the time so you're like you do, you're yeah. aware of what's going on and she's been exactly. doing that for like past 40 years and wow um, and you know That's awesome. interesting part of, about it all is like i remember when i was a kid you know i was like hammer it was hammered to my head that you have to build immunity against things right and the the, the only way you're going to build immunity is like just being exposed to certain things and I, i'm not saying like that you, you're supposed to be exposed to to covid specifically right that's yeah you right. know that's i don't know if that's a if that's a logical conclusion of that i i don't think it is but yeah. i think what people are missing and i'm, I'm kind of learning it uh, to a degree from, from what's going on and, and questioning. Let's put it this way, questioning, because like we've been duped. Like the, you, you live in LA, right? You live in the yep. LA area. Not, not specifically LA, but LA area. You've, you've seen what kind of restrictions the, may, the mayor, the idiot mayor of the city has made for, for, for beaches, for instance. Like, exactly. oh, you can go on a beach, but the moment you stop walking, you're going to get arrested. It's like, the fuck is yeah. going on, right? Like, I know. That makes no sense. It doesn't. It's so people contradictory. Are treat, yeah, pre, people are treated as idiots. That's what mm-hmm. what's scary, and it, it, it's non-consistent. No, nothing of it makes sense. It's been handled like so poorly. So, yeah. like, obviously, you're gonna question all of that. But I, I remember, sure. like, you know, I've been always, I was told, like, you have to build immunity, and like, what happens when you're isolated for like months? You're having no immunity to anything because you're not nope. interacting with any bacteria. Yeah, and then the Lysol usage, like you use oh, Lysol all the time, that yep. just kills your immunity, man. Like you're gonna it like does. the moment flu flu season comes in, you're gonna be hurting. Yeah, that's true. So, no, you have you're bringing up very staple points on on healthcare and just how things are being thought of at the moment. Yeah, but I think it's uh we're all on the same page. We're all learning this together, and yeah. I think it's you know there's so many different points of view about it in terms of is it the flu is it like the flu you know and you're hearing we don't know so many no there's we so don't, m- so we don't know if it's seasonal yeah yeah there's a lot of misinformation and i think that we just got to be smart about how we you know interact with people and also respect it as if it's deadly yeah, you know it's, it could be you, and it's mutating you know, and it's changing all the time they right. they know already that there are different strains. The the strain that is in Europe is completely different and, and way more aggressive than the one that comes from China. Yep. I mean, uh, yeah, it's 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 all messed up. It's all like and it's all like developing. Um, I don't think I don't think vaccine is the way to go either because like you don't have a vaccine for uh, mm-hmm. like you cannot. I mean, the, the vaccine what it's going to do is exactly what the flu shot does. It will give right. you some immunity. Because it's yep. a it's a flu like virus, it is it's from the corona you know mm-hmm. you know SARS two SARS two yeah whatever, mm-hmm. uh, it it has the same properties as as flu like viruses meaning it's it's constantly Correct. evolving and it will evolve mm-hmm. it's not like uh it's not like Ebola or you know other diseases that are very constant and you can sure. vaccinate uh, against that and then you right. you have the I mean I, there is no vaccination for Ebola like, that's like a stretch but. But you get my point. There's some diseases that are constant. You can get vaccinated for them and you're not going to get sick. Right. And, I, you know, I don't from from what I hear, like vaccines, that's that's years away. Yeah, because, well, they already have vaccines, but the trials are what take time. It can take up to yeah. a year to go through trials. I think it, and, um, I think the lower end was a year, right? Because like the, the problem the with end. vaccines yeah. is that if you if you do it wrong, a lot of people are going to die. Right. Yep. We have family that are in the CDC and we've had talks with them and they're saying it's 8 months to a year. Okay. At the at the beginnings of a trial. Right. And then and then from there there are like a second trial where it makes sure that everything's working in the public. So we don't even know until we get there. So I still and going back to our how we rooted to this topic, yeah, that's where I feel like our industry is going to suffer in the live action world. And especially oh, yeah, being sure. in a studio, you're going to see smaller amounts of people going back to work. People will be wearing masks. They will be a, a little bit more separate in gr- in their groups. And then I think there'll be a lot more temperature testing and swabbing in the office. 
that's going to be the new reality. And it already is in until, a lot of different businesses. Until, until yeah. they put in contract that it's your own responsibility and you cannot right. litigate. And then everything right. is back to normal. Of course, if you put pen to and pad I think that's what's gonna happen. and it's legal, people yeah. will say, okay, I'm, I'm willing to do that. I'm in good health. I'm fine. But you see healthy people getting sick. So that's, that's the scary part. And I think yeah. I'm not willing to flip that coin. Flip the coin. Yeah, flip the <laughs> coin. <laughs> Take the right pill, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it's yeah. Yeah, the, the most frustrating part about this is um, there's a lot, of un- a lot of unknown. It's not as scary as people were saying it's going to be. And obviously, we learn as we go. It's it's near nowhere near as bad as as people are saying it's going to be. But right. again, like we've learned that over time. Yep. My problem is our rights as citizens are being heavily infringed because of it, and of course for no reason. Like right. Because yeah. the data and even CDC came out recently saying like, mm-hmm. hey, like you cannot do that anymore. Like you cannot. Yep. Keep people locked up in houses That's true. and 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 the you know obviously. There's the, the things like keep the distance, wear a mask. Those mm-hmm. are like the, the things you can just tell. Yeah, fundamentals yeah. you can tell to the public. And yeah. for, for the most part, people are going to be intelligent enough to to take to take responsibility. Not all of totally. them. There's idiots everywhere. And it's no not matter only, where you go. And it's not only America, okay? Like yeah. uh, Europeans, I'm from Europe. Europeans mm-hmm. like to say Americans are idiots, but there is yeah. a lot of idiots in Europe as well. Okay. No, but nobody's exempt. Yeah, nobody's exempt. Nobody's yeah. exempt. And We're all humans. Yeah, <laughs> America is not just like deep south and fucking yeah. deep south rural areas. Totally, where they, man. Yeah, or like you know, where they show you rednecks. That's yeah. It's a pa- it's this, a part of the country, but that's not you know. It's like and what I'm not you're even saying, saying is that, good that's, though, because it's like the due diligence part. People just need to do their due diligence indiv- as individuals, right? And and have the knowledge that they do, and be smart about how they move back into this society and how they reassimilate into their own people. Because yeah. it's like I'm not going to go and just give my neighbor a hug right now. Yeah, you know, exactly. I'm not going to go give myself give my homies fish, fist bumps unless I I know where they've been, kind of thing. It's like you just got to be smart. And, you know, as much as I want to give my mom a hug right now, she's dealing with COVID patients. Yeah. And I haven't really have to hugged be her. Careful. I, I gave her air hugs. I'm like, hey, mom. Uh, just for due diligence, because so, I, I want to be sure that <laughs> when I'm saying deep south, I'm saying the ster- stereotype of deep south, right? Because yes, I live in LA course. and people yeah. in LA, that's what frustr- it's what's frustrating. People yeah. in LA, they're so like, oh, like, I mean, you remember that phrase flyover flyover uh, states? Yeah. How many fucking idiots live in LA? There's oh. so many. So yeah. many. And even mm-hmm. dumber than than people living in like rural areas. You know? Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. It's across the board. It's it's a good, nice flat curve of idiosity everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm not disagreeing, you know, yeah, you're going to have a percentage of that everywhere. Yeah, you are. So, yeah, That's it's, true. it's funny. But I agree. I think I think um, I mean, it already it's already affecting specifically live action for sure. I don't think it touched animation. And you can tell tell me more about that, obviously. But I think animation yeah. was least touched. Video games are kind of going still. They had like right. a, almost like a bump. In the yes. road where it's like, okay, we have to adjust and sure. then we keep going. I mean, I, I have... think we're all kind of affected, even in animation too, because production is where you're affected the most is when you're working right. with your vendor and you actually have like, because a lot of studios are set up now where you're working with a vendor versus doing everything in house. So the vendor searches are harder to do before you can just fly out to a vendor and share your bid package with them and get your, your quotes back. It's not the same anymore. Now everything has to be packaged digitally. There's a lot more waiting that happens. So I'd say it's it's it grinded slow, and then now it's like picking back up again. It's taken a few months to kind of reset its its configuration, but now everybody's reconfiguring again and going, okay, we can do this, but it's just a little slower, and there's a little bit of a disability right now with how we are connected. So now we're just trying to like make it more of like a streamlined process. And I think right. now people are starting to learn how to do that. And I think it's going to get better from here on out. 
it just took a little bit of time for everybody to reconfigure and get their their gears locked into the right position before we can kind of go forward again. Yeah. So like anything, there's say, a shake up. Are you trying to say that middle <laughs> management has been put on the spot and they actually have to do work? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh my God, man. I don't even want to say that'll be a part two conversation yeah. for us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that'll be a part two for sure. Uh, yeah, man, no I know, I, I know you have limited time today yeah. and, uh, I'm pretty sure we'll, we'll, we'll do it again pretty soon. I'd love we, to. Yeah. We this have, has been great. Yeah. We have Tom to, to catch up and talk about, we even like, we didn't, didn't even, didn't even touch on your like professional work at all. Like we just That's mentioned okay. briefly. That's yeah. cool. That's cool. I like to keep it like loose and organic and whatnot. Of course. Um, but I knew I knew we we're gonna have limited time. I do have limited time. Not as limited today, but but yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm I gonna you know get get busy soon. Well, let's. Um, how about this? Let's do a part two of this. And, oh yeah, hundred um, percent. And we can dive into like more of the personal work and the professional work and chat more yeah. about that. Yep. 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 Cool. We're gonna do all that. All right, man. Where where can people find you? Uh, you can reach out to me on Instagram, uh, Jason Shire Art, or you can just check out my website, which is parallaxinfinite.com. Parallax Infinite. All right. Okay. That sounds cool. Yeah. Uh, good. Is there anything you want to plug in? Like anything going on from like your perspective that any interest, like, oh my God, I have my book or something like that? <laughs> Not really. I think uh, for me, I, I try to keep it on a little bit of more on the humble side. Mm -hmm. I just... If anybody has any questions for me personally after listening to this podcast and want to know more about how I work, mm -hmm. please reach out anytime. I'm super open to questions and to giving feedback. That's how I always I have been. And um, I'm all about education and learning. So just reach out anytime. Everybody's open to me. So that's Sounds great. good, brother. Sounds yeah, good. Yeah, man. All right. So people can find you. Uh, I'll list I'll list that uh, all of that in the description and there's going to be like a little pop up on the screen with the with the IG handle. Perfect. Uh, cool. Thanks for listening, awesome. everyone. Um, yeah, thank you, guys. You can find the podcast everywhere. It's everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> it's everywhere. It's iTunes. It's Spotify, man. It's like wow. Stitcher. It's Castbox. <laughs> it's SoundCloud. There's a uh, there's a uh, radio something and I think it's going to be on the high iHeart radio pretty pretty wow. soon. You got all your it's bases a, covered. A, yeah, it's it's everywhere, man. Like for listeners, it's everywhere and then like if you want to watch it obviously on YouTube. Anyone who's listening and enjoying it, yeah, you can definitely leave leave a comment, leave a like, subscribe. I know yeah. it's it's been beaten to the ground, but all of those things help to bring more visibility to the podcast. So and thank um, you so much for having me. And, and I love what you're doing dude, with always. this podcast. This is amazing. So keep doing what you're doing. This is awesome. And we need this more than ever right now to have these kind of the conversations. Yeah, dude, the, the, the positive feedback that I've gotten since I ramped up because of COVID, it's been I, not, nothing but love, man. Nothing That's amazing. Love. It's been, it's been pretty that. amazing. I love you guys. And uh, Thank you so much for I get those DMs all the time, uh, every other day, and yeah, I couldn't be more thankful because it's like yeah, it's ah oh, fuck yeah, it, all all of it is just like it's like a nice um, not recognition but but like a nod for it's for hard the work, man. Yeah, you put in the time, the energy, and now you have a community that follows our cafe. Yeah, and that's the the essential part of it is that everybody wants a part of that and wants to listen and to wants to be a part of what you're doing. So thank you for putting this together for us. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah. it too. I appreciate for I, we could actually you know catch up for once. You know? Yeah, no <laughs> but doubt, let's definitely man. do it great. together again. Uh, okay. I think after the call we can we can talk about when. Um, sure. Cool. All right, guys. Cool, man. Cheers. Cheers. Awesome. That's it.